the book took four years to write and four years to research. So basically 2020 was when I really started this. Um, reading sometimes five, six papers a day, day in, day out, year after year after year. And eventually you get to a point where you go, oh, okay, I think I've got a good enough, good enough grasp on this now to start putting my thoughts and ideas and culminating them onto a, onto a uh, more formal piece of work. Det här är utan tvekan den mest kontroversiella intervjun jag har gjort hittills. Men jag får hela tiden till mig på olika sätt att jag ska göra den här intervjun. Så so here we go. Och jag måste bara få dela med mig av min egen resa i detta. När jag för första gången hörde talas om att virusteorin inte har bevisats så stämplade till och med jag det som en konspirationsteori. Och det har tagit mig tre år av timvis lyssning och research för att till slut landa i att göra den här intervjun. Men med det sagt så är det extremt svårt för oss, för vår hjärna, att lära om oss något redan inlärt. Det är bara så vår hjärna funkar och speciellt när det är någonting som vi har fått lära oss sedan barnsben och som ses som en fastlagen sanning. Så med det sagt, detta är information som kräver att du har ett helt öppet sinne. Då menar jag ett helt öppet sinne. Tänk om ingenting är som vi tror. Today I have the great honor to be joined by Daniel Roydas and I'm trying to find some suitable words or title to introduce you but I think you'll do a better job introducing yourself. So before we dig into today's super interesting topic could you please just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Cecilia, for having me on your podcast. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. My name is Daniel Reuters and I spent over 10 years as a lecturer and senior lecturer at colleges and universities around Australia in the field of nutrition and natural medicine. And I taught there happily for many, many years until around about late 2022 when I resigned from my position uh, because I didn't feel like I could ethically teach there anymore uh, because I didn't feel like the curriculum was in line with my uh, beliefs and perspectives around health and medicine anymore and I felt that uh, it was moving away from the real natural medicine and uh, losing its true magic and, and purpose so for that reason I left and it allowed me to focus on finishing a uh, piece of work that I've been working on for many years and maybe we'll get to talk about that today. But that's a little bit about me and my background. Thank you, Daniel. Then let's get into today's topic, germ theory and tearing theory. Let us start here. You've written a book called Can You Catch a Cold? Can you tell us what it is about and why it's so controversial? Yeah, it's uh, a good question. The book is about, it's about exploring the idea of contagion and disease transmission and whether or not this phenomena actually occurs. Because from a young age, we're told that if you're in close proximity to someone who's sick, you can get sick by being exposed to their germs through a cough or a sneeze. And I heard about this idea that germs weren't necessarily contagious in early 2020 from a bunch of medical doctors who were talking on this idea. And at the time I heard that information, it reminded me that I'd been exposed to it once before. And that was in my undergraduate degree, sometime around 2005 or six, when I first started te uh, learning natural medicine. So the idea immediately clicked with me that germs may not in be, indeed be what we are taught they are. And because of my position at the university and given that I present quite frequently, or at the time I was at least, presenting quite frequently uh, to the general public and clinicians and practitioners around the world, 
I knew that I was going to be asked about this topic and I also felt strongly that I would want to talk about it. So I thought I better go and do the research to make sure that when I talk about this idea that I've dotted all my I's and crossed my T's. So I went searching for any human experiments that I could find demonstrating that disease is contagious. And what I found was contrary to the long-held belief that you can catch a cold from somebody. So yeah, I found over 200 experiments that essentially cast doubt on this idea that you can catch someone else's cold. And a friend of mine reached out, and his name's Roman Bistrianic, and he's written a book called Dissolving Illusions. It's a very good book. If your guests haven't come across his work, I highly recommend that they go and check it out. And he said, look, I know you've got all these experiments that you've found. Uh, you should really put all this into a book. And that's really where the, the idea from the book came from. And the rest is history. I spent the next three, four years researching and writing. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I recent, recently published the book about uh, six weeks ago now. And um, yeah, it's been a, an interesting ride since publishing it. Um, and I guess you, you also mentioned that it's a controversial topic. I actually think the opposite perspective is controversial. So I think the idea that you can't catch someone else's disease is the true and, and um, accepted, or it should be the accepted position. And the actual controversial or conspiratorial position is that you can catch someone's disease. So I think uh, hopefully this work that I've done and the work of other people like Dr. Sam and Mark Bailey and Tom Cowan and Andrew Kaufman and Kelly Brogan and these uh, exceptional people are brought to the forefront and uh, given the attention and time they deserve to help change the perspectives of the world on a really important topic. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, but for someone who isn't that familiar with the scientific method, could, can you please just explain a little bit about uh, it and how exactly they have not proven the germ th uh, theory and why that is important to know? Yeah, the scientific method is essentially a process. I don't want to get too bogged down in the details here because we might lose some people or it might be a little bit too uh, dry. But the scientific method is essentially a process uh, of investigation, it's a method that researchers and scientists and even people in general life can follow. They can follow this process, it's um, logical, it's reasonable, it's stepwise. You can follow this process to establish a cause and effect relationship. So if you want to establish uh, the effect of sunlight on the growth of goldfish, you can develop a scientific experiment for that where you control for all the other variables like the amount of food the uh, goldfish gets, the water that it's swimming in, uh, the type and amount of food. Uh, you can control for the environment that it's in so that nothing else is different between one group of goldfish and another group of goldfish except a thing called the independent variable, which is a thing that you're trying to study. And that would be the amount of sunlight that those um, different groups of goldfish that you're experimenting upon uh, receive. So you might give one group of goldfish all the same things, but you expose them to one hour of sunlight a day. And then you might do the same with another group of goldfish, but they get eight hours of sunlight exposure per day. And you find that the, sun, the goldfish getting exposure to eight hours of sunlight actually grow faster and bigger. So that would be a way in which you can t show scientifically that sunlight makes goldfish grow faster. And you can, do, you can use this same principle to establish a cause and effect relationship with any naturally observed phenomena. So the naturally observed phenomena when it comes to germs is that a sick person, when they come in contact with a healthy person, transmits disease. So it's very simple to design an experiment like that. You would get 
a group of healthy people, a group of sick people, and put them together in a room under controlled conditions and see how many healthy people get sick. This is probably one of the easiest, most basic experiments that could be done to demonstrate such a claim. And lo and behold, these experiments have been done many, many, many times. What happened when researchers did this? Well, they really struggled to show that healthy people get sick when this happens, which goes against everything we're told about colds and flus. So that would be one example of how you can use a scientific method to demonstrate um, transmission and contagion. And then it, it just say you found that healthy people were getting sick. Well, then you would need to prove what it was that was making someone sick. And we're told it's a germ. We're told that it's a virus. So again, you would need to go to the sick person, find the virus inside their bodily fluids, show that it actually exists in nature first, take some snot, look at it under a microscope, there's the virus, take out just the virus, now you have the independent variable, and you then expose that to the healthy person or a group of healthy people to see if it recreates the disease in question. And that has never been done, not once in the history of, of medicine. Has that scientific experiment taken place? And this is a big problem because we're told that it's been done. People accept and expect that it's been done. But unfortunately, we've been hoodwinked and uh, they haven't done this. I'm not saying that they can't do it, but they just haven't done it yet. And what that means is that this idea that there are invisible microscopic pathogenic particles floating through the air that infect healthy people and make them sick has never been proven. And that is a really big problem, especially considering we shut the whole world down and took away people's fundamental human rights based upon this uh, unsubstantiated idea. Okay, wow. So if the germ theory fails on proving what is supposed to prove, then shouldn't shouldn't the medical society know about this? Shouldn't there be more medical professionals who have come to the same conclusions as you have and also speak out about this? Uh, many medical professionals and scientists have spoken out about this consistently for the last hundred and something years since the inception of germ theory. And this is well documented. It's in the medical literature. So it's not the first time that uh, doctors since, say, 2020 have started speaking out in greater numbers about this. And there are many, but again, uh, there's also many who decide for whatever reason not to speak out because maybe they're concerned that it will draw the wrong attention to them and they may lose their medical license and their ability to practice and earn a living. And they may not necessarily want to deal with the ridicule that goes along with questioning things like germ theory. So uh, there are a number of reasons why we may not see more people questioning and, and speaking out about this, but there are enough at the moment who are doing a, a very good job uh, to bring the public's attention to this problem. But as I said, there are many scientists and doctors who have written and published in the medical journals over the last hundred and say 20 years about these very issues that doctors are raising today. But unfortunately, those issues have never been dealt with. They've never been addressed. They've been hand waved away and swept under the rug for various reasons. And we can certainly uh, get into maybe what some of those reasons are later on in the discussion. But really what it, it comes down to is that this idea has been put forward, I believe, for, with malicious intent and for purposes of uh, control over the population. And it was done with purpose and for a reason. Now, but 120 years ago when this 
idea was put forward, it was serving some people to uh, push this idea. And it gained traction. And I'm not sure if they thought it would ever go this far, but it has. And they doubled down on this idea time and time again when evidence pointed towards the fact that the theory is incorrect, when the theory was disproven, and when many, many people in the scientific and medical communities questioned this idea openly. But the medical profession doubled down and they said, no, no, this is how it is and we're not going to listen to any criticisms or entertain it. We're just going to call you crazy nutbags and that's going to be the end of the story. Now that's a problem because there's been a lot of harm caused based upon this idea. And if it turns out that it is not true and it's ever accepted by the general public, I'm not sure that uh, an apology would cut it. I think people would be um, very, very upset, uh, to say the least, if this idea was ever exposed to be um, untrue or faulty. And there would be a lot of damage control that the field of medicine and science would have to do to try and prevent the system of medicine crumbling and probably other uh, institutions and organizations and, and disciplines of science would also have to do a lot of damage control to maintain and save face because the, uh, as I said, the damage that has been done is so great I'm not sure that there would be enough money in the world to uh, make up for all the problems that the false and disproven theory, that is germ theory, has caused. Amen. So this takes us to the big question. If viruses don't spread between people, then why do I get a cold or a flu the day after my daughter gets sick and the next day my husband gets sick? This seems to me like if the disease spreads between us. Yeah, there's lots of examples of people falling sick with the same symptoms at the same time, one after the other. But we know that those instances weren't caused by viruses or contagious germs. So take so-called nutritional deficiency diseases, for example. In the 1700s, scientists and doctors believed that scurvy was contagious. A ship would go out onto the high seas and within a few months, there would start to be a couple of sailors falling ill with symptoms. Their gums would start to bleed. Their skin would start to break out in rashes. They would become fatigued. They get muscle wasting, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. They would become very, very ill. And it would eventually lead to death. And it would start with one sailor, and then a few days later, the next one, the next one, and the next one. And before you know it, the entire ship's crew had been affected by this. And for that reason, scientists believed that it was a contagious spreading illness. But we know that it's not. It was just simply a deficiency in real fresh food. Uh, there are even examples in more modern times. So in the 60s, there was a small fishing village in Minamata of Japan. And there was about 50,000 people in this fishing village, many of whom started to fall ill with similar symptoms. They actually thought it was infectious meningitis at the time. They quarantined people, they locked the city down, they decontaminated their homes, and they treated this like an infectious disease. One person after another catching what it seemed like was catching the same illness. But it turns out what was going on was there was a local company, a fertilizer manufacturer who dumped toxic waste into the local waterways, which then went out into the ocean and the local people were catching fish and seafood and consuming that uh, toxic food that were being poisoned by methyl mercury and experiencing these uh, neurological symptoms. So what appeared to be a contagious infectious illness wasn't. It was actually just common environmental exposure to a poison or a toxin. And this is very possibly what's going on when people fall ill with colds and flus. They may be exposed to a common environmental phenomenon, 
It doesn't have to be a virus or a bacteria. Uh, they may also be exposed to common environmental and meteorological changes. So we know that changes in the weather, humidity and temperature, for example, can cause changes in the respiratory tract that manifest with the exact same symptoms as a cold or flu. Uh, so there may be people living in an area together and in that particular area, there's a change in humidity. It impacts the, physio the physiology of their respiratory tracts and they fall ill and they think, oh, well, it must have been contagious because we all got it. <laughs> so yeah, appearances can be deceiving when it comes to these things. And at the end of the day, the symptoms that we get, which are called cold and flu symptoms, are actually the answer to the problem. They are not the problem. So we're under this impression that there's a virus that spreads and it infects me and then it infects you and it causes symptoms, coughing and sneezing and fever and various other symptoms, to spread bodily fluids around so that it can spread the virus to other people. Viruses are very smart for so-called uh, dead inanimate objects. They're smart like that. They have this uncanny, uncanny ability to cause these um, infectious uh, and contagious symptoms that allow it to spread to one another, uh, allow it to spread to other people. But in fact, when you start to look into what is really going on, these symptoms are not the problem. The symptoms are the answer to the problem. So what that means is you get uh, exposed to maybe some polluted air first and the pollution in the air comes in and it gets, uh, it damages your respiratory tract and then the body has to clear out that damaged um, tissue in your lung. So it does that by creating mucus, shedding the lining of your lungs and inducing coughing and sneezing to clear all of that stuff out. So actually the coughing and the sneezing and the spluttering and the fever and the fatigue, that's all the body's healing process. Whereas we've been led to believe that it's actually the disease process and that being sick is bad. And that when you get sick, it's caused by a bad thing called a virus. It's not the case at all. Colds and flus are good things. They are there, there to serve you. They have a purpose and a role. And they're there, they're basically to uh, restore balance and restore health. And in some instances, uh, save people's lives. Because if you weren't clearing out the dead and dying tissue and various accumulated toxins in your lungs, over time, your respiratory tract wouldn't be able to function properly. And that's a big issue because you need to be able to breathe to bring in clean, fresh oxygen into the body to maintain normal body functions. Okay, so yeah, sometimes people, uh, it saved people's life, but sometimes people die. Yeah, sometimes people do die. But the body is it's giving its last ditch attempt to clear that stuff out of your system. Because if you don't, the body's going to be overburdened with whatever it is that it's trying to get out. And you're more than likely going to die anyway from the accumulation of that stuff. So the body says, right, we can either face certain death or we can give it a go to try and clear this stuff out. And we know that it's going to take... 80% of what's left in the tank and we've only got 81% left in the tank. And it may be the thing that actually uh, results in that person passing away. However, the, we can't blame the healing response on well, as the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is the exposure to the air pollution. It's the exposure to all the stuff in our food and our drinking water that causes these issues. The more polluted our environment, the worse the symptoms are going to be because the body has to work harder to clear out more accumulated toxic waste from the system. So if we were to clean up the environment and reduce our exposure to these harmful pollutants, then cold and flus may not be so bad. 
they may be very, very mild in comparison to what they are today. And people wouldn't be so adversely affected. Now, you may be able to hear in my voice that I actually sound a little bit congested right now. And that's because I've just recovered from a flu. And it's very interesting how I got that flu. I went traveling for about a week to a city called Hanoi, which is in Vietnam. And that turns out, when I was there, it turns out that it was the most heavily polluted city in the world. The air was so thick, you could barely see through it. So heavily polluted. And I went there, I spent a few days walking around and breathing in this toxic air. And lo and behold, a few days later, I'm incredibly unwell. I have a, quite a severe flu and my body really uh, had to work hard to eliminate all of that toxic stuff that I'd been inhaling for the several days that I was there. Now, whilst that wasn't a pleasant experience being, being unwell with the flu, um, I'm glad that my body did what it had to do to make sure that it could clear out all that unwanted stuff that if left in my body would continue to do damage and cause uh, untold damage to various other parts of my body. Yeah, because what about the people living there in the city? How does that affect, like they, they can not go around being sick all day long, all week after week, right? That's right. But if you actually look at uh, the rates of mortality and disease and the rates of things like bronchitis and pneumonia, uh, the rates of cancer and various different things in these areas, they are sky high. They are incredibly high, much higher than in areas, say like in Australia, from where I'm from, that has comparatively much cleaner air. And we know that uh, this toxic polluted air is some of the, it's one of the worst things that human beings can be exposed to. So the, the stuff, the pollution in the air is called particulate matter, PM 2.5. It's um, one of the most harmful substances known to man. And people are inhaling this day in, day out, and it does significantly uh, impact their health outcomes. Just f so people get an idea of just how problematic this stuff is, inhaling air pollution causes more deaths per year I think uh, from memory, it's around about 10 to 11 million people per year die from inhaling uh, polluted air. Comparatively, about 9 million people worldwide die from cancer. So actually inhaling polluted air kills more people than cancer does. And then you also have to ask yourself the question, how many of those cancer deaths were actually caused by br breathing in polluted air? So this number is astronomical and the effects are profound. It's just that we look at things like cancer and give it far more attention uh, than air pollution. It's sort of like out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and, and this is another reason why you see like lots of air filtration uh, units in people's homes. People walk around with respirators on their faces all day. Um, and also, when your body is exposed to this level of pollution on an ongoing basis, it can adapt to that in some uh, manner. Whereas someone like me, I just go in there, I haven't adapted to that, and I just get air, air, um, lungfuls of pollution. It's equivalent to smoking 50 cigarettes a day in some cases in these cities. Uh, my body's not used to that. So, of course, I would be ex exceptionally sick. Uh, whereas if you live there, your body adapts to it. It increases its capacity to deal with some of these things. And therefore, it's not as it adversely affected in the short term. But long term, we know that this actually reduces uh, people's lifespan significantly. This makes me think about HARP and geoengineering. Do you know about this? Yeah. It could take your mind to some dark places. <laughs> Well, this theory, terrain theory, can you tell us some more about that? It goes a long way back, right? Uh, so could you take us through this uh, history and what it says? Yeah, the terrain theory is essentially the antithesis to germ theory. 
So germ theory states that a healthy person can be walking down the street and for no other reason, completely out of the blue, they get sick because a germ floating through the air enters into their body and infects them and causes disease. Terrain theory states that actually the health of the environment the person lives in, the inputs that they're exposed to, so the amount of sunlight, exercise, the quality of food they get, the amount of sleep that they get, uh, whether or not they have purpose and meaningful relationships in their life, um, if they've got exposure to clean air and drinking water and these kinds of things, all of that determines the health of the individual. And this idea was championed by what they called sanitarian doctors back in the sort of 1700s. This idea really started to take off where they were focused more on cleaning up the environment and making sure that people had clean water to drink, healthy, fresh food to eat. They had shelter. They had warmth. They had uh, all exposure and access to all the things that human beings require to be healthy in order to maintain good public health. This was their focus. They didn't believe that germs caused illness. They believed that germs were the consequence of illness. So if you were exposed to a poison in the water or you didn't have good enough food to eat or you were very stressed or you weren't getting enough sleep or enough sunlight or whatever it might be, the vitality of your tissue is compromised and it starts to degrade and die. We know things like this happen, for example, with things like scurvy. If you don't get enough fresh food, your tissue literally starts to break down and die. Uh, or if you are a smoker and you're smoking lots of cigarettes, that smoke will damage the lining of your tissue and the tissue will start to break down and die. Only once the tissue becomes dead or it's, di it's dying does our own bacteria inside and on our body actually then proliferate to those areas of dead and dying tissue and starts to break that tissue down. Uh, sanitarians were of the belief that bacteria do not attack healthy tissue. So as long as a person was able to maintain health through all those things that I just mentioned, the presence of a germ is inconsequential. And actually, Around that same time, 1700s, 1800s, even into the 1900s, surgeons, this is very, very interesting, surgeons came out in droves pushing back against this idea of germs causing disease because they said people don't get infections when they do surgery if they clear out all of the dead matter from the wound. So if they clear out the dead matter, there's no food supply for the bacteria. There's nothing there for them to eat. So there's no infection. No, nothing happens. But if they didn't do a very good job and they left some dead matter in there, the bacteria would come along and do what bacteria do. It's break down dead and dying tissue. We would see this and go, oh, they've got an infection. A germ's gotten in there and started to cause disease. Interestingly, the surgeon's noted that even if they did leave a bit of dead or dying tissue inside the wound, the bacteria would never damage the healthy tissue around it. That would only damage the dead and dying tissue. So that would break that tissue down and it would form into what we call pus. So we actually look at a wound when it's all pussy and festering. And we go, oh, there's a bacteria that's gotten in there and now it's destroying all the healthy tissue and causing disease. Not the case at all. So, yeah, Germ theorists state that germs cause disease. Terrain theorists, or the sanitarian medicine, and doctors who practice sanitarian me medicine, were of the opposite opinion. They said that germs are the consequence, or the answer to disease. I got it. But what I still today have trouble like wrapping my head around are these pandemics we've seen through the history, such as the Spanish flu 
the Hong Kong flu and this so-called corona pandemic we just witnessed. So how does the terrain theory explain that? In the 1800s and 1900s, there was a group of, there, there was a discipline of medicine called medical meteorology. And what this field of medicine specialized in and looked at was the impact of the environment and the changes of weather conditions uh, on the human body. Now, in relation to things like pandemics, for example, when there are changes in humidity, the weather doctors postulated that those changes in humidity cause fluctuations in various different compounds in the atmosphere, things like uh, ozone, for example, ammonia, nitrous oxide, various other different naturally occurring compounds. And exposure to those compounds can directly cause irritation and damage to the lungs, but also changes in things like humidity and temperature can dry out the lungs. They can uh, stop the body's natural clearing and detoxification mechanisms of the lungs. And it is by these uh, meteorolog meteorological changes that uh, pandemics occur. So large groups of people are obviously exposed to these meteorological changes and we see uh, yeah, hundreds or thousands of people in an area falling ill and we call it a, a pandemic or an epidemic. So that, yeah, that's one explanation as to um, what was going on. We look at things like uh, the Spanish flu, for example, and we're told that it was the most destructive, highly infectious pathogenic uh, disease known to men that it killed somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 100 million people and 500 million people were hospitalized yada 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 but some very interesting things were going on around that time so we had world war one for example and it just so happens that at the time World War I was going on and they started using things like battle gas, so chemical warfare, releasing hundreds of millions of tons of a respiratory uh, agent into the air in various different countries around the world, that people started falling ill with symptoms that were identical to gas poisoning all around the world, but we were told that it was a flu when in fact it could very well have been exposure to poison gas. Now, I don't know if um, you've ever looked at the symptoms of the Spanish flu, but the, the symptoms are really interesting. They're very, very particular, and we haven't seen symptoms like that of a cold or flu before or since. So the symptoms included things like heliotrope cyanosis, where the body turned a deep black-purple color you could be walking, you could wake up in the morning at 9 o'clock and by 11 o'clock your body was completely black and you were dead on the street. Um, people were coughing up blood and um, yellow frothy phlegm uh, that would bleed from the mouth and the eyes and the nose. They would um, develop right-sided heart failure and pass away. One really interesting symptom is that they said they smelt like musty hay or straw or sometimes freshly cut grass. The people with the Spanish flu had this musty hay smell. Well, it's, maybe it's just coincidence, but all of those symptoms were also reported in gas victims on the battlefield. So the young men who were on the front lines fighting, when they were exposed to poison gas, they would also develop these same symptoms. If they were pulled off the battlefield and taken to a field hospital, the doctors and surgeons were, were reporting in the medical literature that they couldn't differentiate, they couldn't tell the difference between the Spanish flu and gas poisoning. 
if those men died and there was an autopsy done, the pathologists who were looking at their lung tissue were reporting that the destruction to the lung tissue was exactly the same, could not be distinguished between gas poisoning and the Spanish flu. Seems like a bit of a coincidence to me that at the time we're developing chemical warfare agents and releasing them across the earth on soldiers, supposedly, that we start seeing this uh, increased number of people dying around the world of this respiratory illness. Now, people might say, but they only released poison gas on the battlefield. So how is it possible that people in cities and built up civilian areas were actually being exposed? Are you saying that the gas was like wafting from the battlefields hundreds of kilometers away into the city and causing problems? Well, there's actually reports by military doctors who were saying that the enemy were using tactics where they would come into cities under the cover of night, under the cover of darkness, with canisters of flu germs, and they would re release these canisters of flu germs in the streets. They were saying that um, saboteurs and spies were going into shopping centers and cinemas and various other public places and releasing canisters of flu germs. This was reported by the military. This was also reported by various news outlets around the world that this was actually happening. So this may be a, a, an explanation as to what was going on with the Spanish flu. It may not have been a germ. It may have actually been um, chemical warfare go gone awry. I don't know if it actually did or not, but it just seems coincidental to me that this actually went on. So yeah, there may be other plausible explanations uh, to explain what we see with these so-called worldwide pandemics. Certainly the uh, pandemic of 2020, I think was a fear-based campaign where people were led to believe that there was something going on and they manifested a lot of these symptoms and things uh, with their mind. There's certainly considerable evidence to suggest this, but also um, in China where this so-called novel pathogen broke out around the same time there were meteorological phenomena that occurred which resulted in um, the build-up of air pollution in the same areas where they reported the epidemic breaking out so the air pollution levels went from uh very sort of low acceptable levels between sort of 30 and 40 micrograms per cubic meter all the way up to 700. So what happened, there was a thing called the temperature inversion, where usually you get um, the sun warming up the ground during the day. And as that hot air rises and it takes away the air pollution with it at nighttime, um, that wasn't happening in places in China around this time because of the temperature inversion. And really what was going on there was a cool layer of air acting like a lid over the top of this warm air closest to the ground and trapped the air pollution closest to the ground. Caused those levels of pollution to go from 30, 40 up to 700. And then we start seeing people complaining of respiratory problems. Now the World Health Organization recommends a maximum allowable limit of particulate matter in the air of five Five. So when we're looking at levels of 700, um, this is equivalent to smoking 50 plus cigarettes a day. So is it any wonder that there were all these people complaining of respiratory um, symptoms at this same time? So I know that's a long winded answer, but there are so many alternative explanations to um, explain what might be going on with pandemics above and beyond this uh, idea of a virus. Yeah, we all know that it's it's something about this corona pandemic that just doesn't make sense. And we all feel it. But like after all these years, what do you believe is keeping the germ theory alive? I think the germ theory was originally used as a scapegoat 
to explain away the detrimental health effects of things like plastic and pesticides. Around the time that germ theory, well, the inception of germ theory, was around the same time that um, plastic was invented and pesticides were invented and started to be sprayed on people's food. Now, we know the harms of plastics and microplastics and pesticides on human health. So would the people have ever accepted the rollout of these things on a mass scale had they known that it was the pesticides and plastics making them sick? I don't think they would have accepted it. They would have pushed back and that industry, well, those industries, never would have gotten off the ground. But I think what happened was that germ theory was used as a scapegoat, as a red herring, to explain away all the disease and destruction caused by the creation and production of these toxic substances with petrochemicals and the mining of fossil fuels and all these kinds of things. Uh, and then also the death and destruction caused by spraying poison into the people's environment and on their food. So it's easier to blame Mother Nature. To say it's not the poison, it's not the plastic, it's this germ which has always been here but it's now just decided to become a problem. Uh, it draws people's attention away from the true underlying cause of the issue. And that has followed through until today where we see ourselves living in areas where, that are heavily affected by air pollution. We have so much microplastic in our environment now that every single week you and I are eating the equivalent of a credit card sized piece of plastic. Four billion tons of pesticide was sprayed on our food last year. You can't get away with doing this if people understand that it's actually this stuff making us sick. But when it's a germ, then no one's going to point the finger at the true culprit and the underlying cause. So they can continue to use these things in industry forever without anyone ever questioning it. So this is like one reason why I think germ theory will never be uh, relinquished by the powers that be because the ones that created the germ theory are the ones that create the pesticides, are the ones that create the petrochemicals and the microplastics and have their hand in basically every single industry. Every single industry relies on petrochemicals and oil and plastic. Their infrastructure relies on it. All the products and services that they offer rely on it. Our clothes are made out of it. Our cars, our houses, um, infrastructure for buildings is made out of this stuff. Our technology is made out of this stuff. It's incredibly damaging to our environment. And it's these things that I believe are actually the true cause of it, of much of the disease that we're seeing in Western society. But they can't turn around and say, oh, sorry, it's actually... Not the germ, guys. We realized we made a mistake. Sorry, it's actually the plastics and the pesticides and all these things. Because the moment that they admit to that, people will be rioting in the streets against the use of all these other things that are actually making them sick. If that happens, society will cease to function. So they will keep up this idea that the germ is the culprit forever. The only way that I see it changing is if individuals change their own perspective and slowly, slowly, slowly over time, we undo this problem and address the issues and change society in a way that we can live conducively and in harmony with nature rather than trying to battle against it. Daniel, why have you picked this fight or how to say it? What, what drives you and motivates you to do this? because I believe it to be true. I believe it to be right. I listen to what's inside here in my heart and I act on the, those feelings and those thoughts and those emotions. Why? Because we're only here for a short amount of time and I don't want to look back on my life with regret. 
I don't want to look back and go, because essentially the way that I see things going currently is that there will be more pandemics. There, we've only just seen the tip of the iceberg here. There's going to be a lot more um, loss of human rights and freedoms and our way of life is under threat. And I want my children to have the same freedoms and um, the same opportunities and to be able to live in a world that's relatively unpolluted and toxic or non-toxic as possible, to enjoy Mother Nature and to not be sick by all, or be made sick by all the things that they're currently pumping into the environment. So I don't want to look back on my last day on this earth and go, hmm, what if I said something? What if I did something? What if I did write that book? Maybe I would have woken up just the one person. I can only do what I can do, and that's put information out there. And the people who are interested and hear that, who knows what they're capable of? Who knows if they're not the person that's going to change the world and, and be instrumental in seeing the uh, end of germ theory? I don't know. As long as I can get to my final day on this earth, whenever that may be, and hold my head high and know that I acted with integrity and honesty, that's all that I can ask for. Everything else is really inconsequential to me. And you have to live without fear. You just have to do this because you're coming from a place, as I said, of, of integrity and love and because you care about humanity and you care about the truth and you care about what's right. So that's why I do what I do. You have to live without fear. Yes, that is like the main thing in life, I think. And speaking of fear, fear plays a role in these diseases. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, fear plays a massive role in disease through causing negative physiological responses. So our lungs are continually clearing themselves out our tissue is continually clearing itself out. It possesses innate, inbuilt detoxification responses and mechanisms. States of fear, anxiety, and stress induce the release of various stress hormones in the body. And that stops that detoxification process from happening because that can be quite energy intensive to do that. So the body doesn't want to be constantly using energy in a state of fight or flight or fear for detoxification, it wants to convert and use that energy to save your life, to help you to run away from the threat. So if you're in a constant state of fear, the body's not in a constant state of detoxification and healing. It's actually in a state of fight or flight where the body is basically in a state of catabolism. It's breaking down tissue rather than repairing and regenerating it. So that's one aspect as to how fear can be harmful long-term or any low vibrational state, fear, anxiety, stress, worry, whatever it might be. Another way is through the nocebo effect. So manifesting disease through thought alone. Now we know that this is a possibility because they've done controlled trials where they've come along to people and said, hey, we're going to expose you to some flu germs. And they expose the person to the germs and then that night they start shivering and coughing and sputtering and they develop a severe flu. And the next morning the nurse comes in and says, gotcha, we lied to you. We didn't actually expose you to flu germs, we just gave you salt water. We told you that we exposed you to flu germs to see what would happen, but we just gave you salt and you didn't get exposed to flu germs at all. And within an hour that person's better. So the power of belief, the power of fear is enough to cause these so-called cold and flu symptoms. So if you can do that just by telling someone they've been exposed to flu germs, imagine what can happen when every media outlet on the face of the planet, every peak health body, every single person in authority, every doctor, every school teacher, every news anchor, Every politician is telling the world on repeat 
that there's a dangerous germ coming, it's lurking in the shadows, it's going to get you, you're going to get these symptoms, it's going to affect this area at this time, this is what to expect, this is what's to happen, it's going to be devastating, people are going to die, panic stations. We're going to see a mass nocebo effect, a mass psychogenic illness. We're going to see mind viruses spreading throughout the community. When in fact, there was nothing spreading at all apart from fear. So if we eliminate fear of germs and eliminate this fear of authority and, and control, then we have nothing to fear. And that goes away and it negates, it negates this um, potential negative nocebo effect that I believe was the driving force behind the most recent pandemic nothing more than a uh, nocebo-induced pandemic. So all of this that we have talked about today is in your book, and you have references to all of it, right? Yes, uh, I, I think from memory there's either 1,200 or 1,400. There's quite a, a number of references. Uh, all of these things and more are discussed in the book. It was written in with the assistance of a team of medical doctors so dr sam bailey for wrote the foreword for the book dr mark oh. bailey her husband uh, they also played an incredible role i also had doctors like uh, dr jordan grant who is a friend of mine and who's done a lot of really good work in this space he helped uh, review the book I had a colleague who was a microbiologist and a virologist help edit and act as a subject matter expert to make sure that the virology section of the book was accurate. Uh, I had a PhD psychologist help edit the book and help with the creation of the uh, th final third of the book, which was based and, and focused around um, the psychology of disease. So I, I really tried to do as much as I can to bring in experts from different fields to look at this and make sure that the information that's being presented is true and accurate. And then to back up basically every single statement that's made with a reference either to a peer-reviewed journal article or a mainstream news article for whatever they're worth. But uh, yeah, it's a great resource for people. And I hope that it's the a catalyst for people to either change their perspective on things and if not change their perspective at least to ask questions and to think a little bit more laterally about the uh, idea of uh, contagious illness. To write this book how many scientific studies have you read? How many have I read? Uh, well at least 1200 <laughs> because that's how many references I've, I've put in the book. <clears throat> so the book took four years to write and four years to research. So basically 2020 was when I really started this, um, reading sometimes five, six papers a day, day in, day out, year after year after year. And eventually you get to a point where you go, oh, okay, I think I've got a Good enough, good enough grasp on this now to start putting my thoughts and ideas and culminating them onto a, onto a uh, more formal piece of work. So yeah, lots and lots of reading, lots of researching, lots of writing, lots of um, back and forth with people and different ideas and, and chopping and changing uh, things. And yeah, it's been quite a long process. And yeah, we cut out probably close to 50,000 words from that book. So even though it's about 100,000 words now, which is a lengthy book, uh, it was much larger, but we did a lot of heavy editing just to really hit home these key points that we've spoken about today. That is an amazing job you've done there. Uh, so I want to ask you one last question before sure. we wrap up. What are your top three pieces of advice on how to stay healthy? And what do you do yourself to keep yourself healthy? Yeah, health is really simple. It's not complicated like we're told. There aren't hundreds and thousands of different diseases and disease isn't a big mystery. 
you are the only person that can heal yourself. No one can heal your body for you. You have control. Don't get sucked into the idea that there are arbiters of health in white coats that hold the secret to your health through a prescription pad or a scalpel. That is not the case. Health is very simple. The body has an amazing capacity to heal itself when you give it what it needs, take away what it doesn't need, and then just get out of the way and let the body do what it's capable of doing. So what are those things that the body needs? It needs sunlight. It needs to be connected to the earth. So go and put your feet on the ground outside. You need fresh air. You need clean food. You need clean, pure water. You need to move your body. Exercise. You need good quality sleep. You need love. Social connection. Meaning and purpose. Uh, You need all of those things for the body to thrive and survive. Now, if you are only doing five of those things and you're unwell going and taking a pill or a potion or trying to do some fandangled intervention, some expensive treatment or whatever, is not the answer to the problem because you're not doing three of those things that the body needs. So if you had a pot plant and it was sick and the leaves were falling off it and someone came along and says, oh, are you giving that pot plant enough water? No. Oh, you realize that that plant's not getting enough sun, you need to put it closer to the window. Oh, and look at the soil. It's the wrong kind of soil. You need to put the right soil in there. It's, this is, um, you, put, you put it in rocks. It needs n- nice, um, good quality soil. It's like a human body. It needs those essential things to do what it needs to do. So when you give that plant some water, some sun and the right soil, all of a sudden now it's flourishing. Same thing with the human body. You need to give it those things that I've mentioned. You need to remove or minimize your exposure to things like heavy metals, toxins. Uh, All of these things are found in like personal care products, deodorant, shampoo, soap, fabric conditioner, um, perfumes, makeups. It's on our clothes. It's coming out of the fumes of out of our cars. It's everywhere. So we have to try and minimize our exposure to these things as much as possible. And when we do that, then the body has the best ability to actually restore balance and homeostasis. That then allows the body to heal itself. There is no magic cure. It's really simple. A lot of people will dismiss what I've said because those things are essentially free. Anyone can do it. You can do it right now. You can go outside and get out in the sun and start moving your body. Um free they're simple low barrier to entry so there's not really that much preventing people from doing it and it's for those reasons that people believe that they can't possibly be beneficial or effective uh, where in fact the opposite is true so everything that we need to thrive and survive mother nature provides for us it's there we just have to realize it and take advantage of it And you mentioned like, what are the things that I try and do? That's what I try and do every day. Um, Get out in the sun, put my feet in the ground, eat good food, drink clean water, move my body, be thankful, be grateful, show appreciation and love, um, maintain good relationships with people. And yeah, get to bed at a reasonable hour, get good quality sleep, minimize my exposure to EMFs, just really basic things it doesn't need to be overcomplicated. have some fun and laugh a little bit yeah i think that's a good recipe for um, for a good health yeah yeah fun um laughter those positive emotions essentially the feeling is the secret so you manifest the feeling you you create the feeling inside you that you want if you're unwell you have an illness then create the feeling of what you think it would feel like when you're well. Imagine that, embody that, create that feeling, and the body will follow. 
And this is a big problem with disease because we're told that disease is the problem. The symptoms are the problem. When you get an illness, it's really bad. And the illness is the thing that's the issue. And your body's broken. And there's something wrong with you. And it's so confusing. And oh my God, there's no answer. What am I going to do? So when you're in that mindset, you're never going to heal yourself. You need to flip that and go, actually, I'm so grateful for my body doing what it's doing. Because all of the symptoms that it's manifesting aren't the problem, they're the answer to the problem. And I'm so glad that my body is mounting this response to bring me back to balance and homeostasis. And I love my body for that. I'm so glad that I've got the opportunity to realize this information and take it forward and do better things for my body. Um, and I'm now going to start doing the things that I know that I need to do deep inside my heart. <laughs> Because if people ask themselves, what is it that I need? If you sit and listen and ask, your body will tell you. And th this is a, it's not really a big secret, but it seems like it is because we've been so confused by uh, modern medicine telling us what they think disease is and what it's caused by, but actually they're really quite far off the mark. All the answers that we need are already out there. We just got to go inside here and ask ourselves what that is. Yeah, I think we're we're disconnected. That's what we we are disconnected from nature and from ourselves. If we just connect again, I think we have a lot of um, answer there. Yeah, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Mm, Danny. Och eh, jag vill bara förtydliga då att det är inte bara Daniel som har kommit till de här slutsatserna utan han har gått sällskap av bland annat Sam Bailey, Tom Cowan, Andrew Kaufman, Michael Jaden eh, och sen är det säkert många fler som inte jag har koll på men det är några av dem som jag vet pratar offentligt om detta. Så om du är nyfiken och vill lära dig mer om det här så kan jag varmt rekommendera dig till att söka på de här namnen på Rumble eller på Spotify. För Spotify censurerar ju inte heller. Så där finns faktiskt en hel del. Och där finns faktiskt även den här podcasten som jag också kan rekommendera. Daniels bok är också otroligt välskriven. Och det finns en kort intervju som bara förklarar komplexiteten och arbetet och innehållet i boken. Så att jag länkar till allt det här nedan i beskrivningen. Så är du nyfiken på detta så in i beskrivningen och klicka dig vidare. Jag fick alltså bara med en bråkdel av all den information och kunskap som finns där utom det här ämnet. Så som sagt, klicka dig gärna in på de här länkarna och fortsätt att lyssna och se om det här resonerar med dig. Och för er som såg min tidigare intervju med cancerforskaren professor Seyfried så tycker jag att det här rimmar lite på något sätt. För Seyfried menar ju också på att det är vår livsstil och miljö som orsakar cancer. Nu uttrycker ju inte han sig så här som Daniel gör. Men det är någonting i det som liksom går hand i hand här. Och jag blev taggad i ett klipp som jag faktiskt tänkte avsluta med. Och som lite förenar Seyfrids forskning med Daniels bok. Så jag avslutar med det och sen ner och kommentera. Jag vill höra vad ni tänker om detta. Jag länkar som sagt till det värsta allt möjligt nere i beskrivningen. Så ner och kika så ses vi snart igen. It's a survival mechanism. All the toxicity through our diet, lifestyle, stress. It needs a place to house those toxins. So they house it in what's called a tumor to protect you. Cancer is not trying to kill you. Cancer is actually trying to save your life. It's creating a tumor, a place for all those toxins to be so that they don't spread to other parts of the body. When you go to a doctor, the first thing they do is say, okay, well, let's take a biopsy. Well, what is a biopsy? It's where they prick the tumor and they see if it was cancerous or not. Well, yeah. first of all, whether the tumor is cancerous or not, your passive treatment is still the same so you don't actually need the biopsy in fact most people don't actually die from cancer they die from the treatment of cancer so when they prick the tumor they're opening it up and allowing the cancer cells and all the, the harmful toxins to now spread throughout the body so now you go from having a tumor on your breast or whatever it is now they do the biopsy they come back and they say okay well now the cancer is spreading all throughout your body mm -hmm.